I had a moment of confusion there when <laughs> someone was talking about uh, stalking people. Because in my accent, I heard stalking. I didn't realize there was a difference between stalking and stalking. <laughs> so I turned to Sinister, do you guys stalk people? Okay, but, <clears throat> but I really am in church and it's, everything's okay. <clears throat> Here's the thing. It's not what God is talking you out of that's incredible. It's what he's talking you into. He's been talking us out of the old man and into the new man for years. He's talking us out of an earthbound spirituality into a kingdom anointing where God is limitless towards us. As he is, so are we in this world. He's talking us into that. Is anything too hard for the Lord? The actual translation of that from God's angle is, is there any situation where I cannot be magnificent? So he's talking you into majesty as a way of thinking, as a way of seeing, as a way of talking, as a way of standing, as a way of acting. He's talking you into majesty. But I also believe, and what I'm here to, uh, my assignment today, is I believe that God is talking us out of getting our needs met into coming into our inheritance. He's talking us out of just getting our needs met into our inheritance. He's talking us out of measure into fullness into abundance because the only way he can be fully represented on earth is through fullness. He's not represented by measure. He's not represented by limits. He's represented by fullness, abundance, and that only comes in the form of the inheritance that he has actually set aside for each one of us. An inheritance in terms of our relationship with him coming into fullness. Jesus said, these things I've said to you so that my joy might be in you. And your joy, full. John 15, 11. Your joy, full. He's talking us into fullness of joy. He's talking us into abundance, not in just in terms of how we receive but how we spend, how we give, how we release. So I'm just the Balaam's ass that's here this morning. <laughs> saying to you that the Lord is saying, enough. 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 Enough of just surviving. Enough of just getting your needs met. Enough of you just making it through. Enough. I've had enough. Had enough. We're not doing that anymore. Now I'm talking you into this. Years ago, the Lord said to me, so uh, Graham, I have a question. What's a prophet doing with a not-for-profit ministry? And I just thought, clearly the wrong thing. And he just said, Graham, the time of you getting your needs met, it's over. I'm done. I need to bring you into fullness. I need. I need to bring you into fullness. I need you to have your inheritance. Because the direction you and I are going in together demands that you see me in a different way, that you interact with me in a different way, that you are more focused in a more powerful way, 
And we can't do that all the time you're focused on just getting your needs met and paying your bills and your staff and all of that stuff. So, son, you and I are going into business together. So I went out that day, and I got a business license. And over the next few years, I started Brilliant Perspectives, which was my ministry, but I turned it into a consultancy. And I called it Brilliant Perspectives because I was hoping to get some. <laughs> right? You've got to give you, if you don't give yourself a name that challenges you, you're already stepping back. So I called, all my businesses are called Brilliant because I think Jesus is brilliant. And we've been on this journey ever since. Now I have three businesses. And um, we're merging everything together. And I can see my inheritance uh, out there ahead of me. And I'm stepping into it. Ten years ago, it was a step of faith. Now it isn't. It's a step of trust. I know God is with me in this. I know God is on this journey with me. And so I know what God is doing. I know the promises I have. I quote them back to him often enough, which is what he, which is what he likes. So he's talking us out of Philippians 4.19. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And he's talking us into Romans 8, 14 to 17. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we upgrade our response from daddy to father. Different language. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're children and heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Jesus. We are fellow heirs with Jesus because he is the one that's going to train us in our inheritance. He's the one that's going to talk to you. He's the one that's living in you. He's the one that's going to be giving you a daily, weekly reminder. Don't forget. I'm training you to be an heir of God. Don't forget, fullness is always ahead of you. Fullness always travels with you because you're an heir now. And you're entering into a deeper, more profound relationship and partnership in Christ with the Father. There comes a time when God needs to elevate us to a whole different level and a whole different dimension of life. And so moving from measure to fullness means you have to have a lens change. You have to see yourself differently. You have to see your circumstances differently. You have to start thinking about them the way that God thinks about them. Your circumstances from this point on, your circumstances are not the problem. Your perception of your circumstances is going to be your problem. And that's why you need a lens change. And I'm hoping that all of us are going to be reminding each other, hang on a minute, you should have a different prescription for your eyesight. Your prescription is now about inheritance. It's not just about making it ends meet. You're a new person, traveling in a different way, at a higher level, with the, with the kind intentions of God right by your elbow, right by your side. And so it's time for us to stop praying like a widow and start praying like a bride. <clears throat> My wife knows that she can get anything out of this old boy. 
And I encourage her in that. Why? Because I want her to be, she is beautiful. I want her to be bold. I want her to be brave. I want her to be certain. I want her to be sure. I want her to be confident that I will do anything in my power to accelerate and elevate who she is because she's my beloved. That's how God feels about us. And we love our wives like God loves the church. There isn't anything I wouldn't do for that girl. I fired her 18 months ago. (laughs) She was my event coordinator, and I fired her in public. She knew it was going to happen. What she didn't know was within 24 hours, I would hire her at a higher level of salary just so she could hang out with Jesus. Because she needs needs something more. And I could feel his heart was like bursting to be something for her. So I hired her so she could hang out with big Jesus. I have like over a million brownie points in my account. We are constantly moving onward and upward in the Lord. And as we're learning to be made in his image and his likeness, he is pursuing us to move away from our current limitation to a place where we connect with fullness constantly, consistently. Not just as a gift, as a benediction, but as a right of sonship in Christ. We're learning to accept a place of absolute privilege in the sonship so that we experience what Jesus felt on earth walking with the Father. That he could do, there were ridiculous things on offer, like, oh, we need to pay our taxes, let's go fishing. Just put your hook in, a fish will come out, open its mouth, you can go pay your taxes and mine. I like fishing. I would love to pay my taxes by fishing. (laughs) Who knows? Here's the thing about fullness. It's so extraordinary, it has no boundaries. It has no limits. There are no impossibilities about it. There's just a sure and certain thing about the nature of God towards us because the one number one thing I love most about God is he never changes. He never changes. And his love for you, therefore, cannot be based on how well or badly you're doing. That is irrelevant to him. He loves because he's full of love, and he loves because he's unchanging, and he will love you all the time because he likes being unchanging. It's an absolute with God. I never change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. That pretty much means that all the mistakes you've made have never moved him away from loving you. He don't change. I ain't changing. And so when he gives you a promise, that same unchanging self comes with it. So you're going to get educated in your inheritance. Some of you are going to leave your jobs when it's time, and God's going to give you a business when it's time. So maybe you might want to start going to night school and learning how to run a business. Some of you have got promises over your life. It's time to bring those prophecies and promises from the background into the foreground of your circumstances so that you can look at them in the context of inheritance. 
Because context determines what God wants to say in the prophetic. So now your context going forward is, I am moving into fullness, into abundance, into my inheritance. So now I need to learn to walk carefully with God in that so that I don't miss anything, so that I don't disavow my potential because my confession hasn't caught up with the intentions of God. So you're all going to be going over your confession, your declaration, your proclamation. Your confession is saying to God, this is who I am now. I'm a beloved son. Your <clears throat> declaration is to your circumstances. I declare that I have an inheritance in the Lord. And so he's going to connect with me in this situation, in that context. And your proclamation is always to the enemy. Don't mess with me, because now I'm getting more money than you. You can't challenge my resources anymore, but my resources are going to challenge you. You know, for where we're going, for where we're going on this campus, for where we're going in Bethel, Cleveland, Steve, we need millions of dollars. We need millions of dollars. And so this is the beginning of that. This is that. Our dreams now, instead of cutting back your dream because you're you don't know if you can believe about resources. Now you have a promise. Now the Lord is saying, you have to accelerate your dream up to this new line. You have to put your dream in the same space as your inheritance. And then begin to seek the Lord. Then begin to ask the Lord, what does this mean? What must I do? How do I partner with you? How do I do this? How do... How, what is it you're wanting me to become next? Am I finished in this job, in this company? Is there another one? Is there another company? Is there a better job? We need to be asking the Lord questions. What does this mean? These are the two best questions asked on the day of Pentecost. What does this mean? Acts 2.12. What must I do? Acts 2.37. Between those two questions... There is a dynamic conversation that you're meant to be having with the Lord. This is the time for outrageous conversations. This is the time to dream. It's also the time to lose all fear. This is the time when we're not going to be driven by the economic problems in the earth. We're not going to be driven by people saying that we are in this percentile of income and earnings. Because God has elevated us above that. But now we have to learn to step into it. And that means you're going to get a different lens. Your lens will give you a different mindset. Your mindset will give you a new language so that you can say things the way the things that God is saying to you, you can say back to him. You can say those things to your circumstances. So there's a zeal, there's an energy that comes when God is giving you an inheritance. Ephesians 1, 3, and 6 talks about that God is giving us an adoption as sons. We all start out being children of God, but there comes a moment in our relationship, a singular moment in time when God looks at you and says, now I'm adopting you as a son. Now I'm going to look at you in the same way that I look at Jesus. And I want you to be looking back at me the way he looked at me when he was on earth the way he depended on me, the way he believed in me, the way he would say, I only do what God is doing and I only say what he is saying. And that is an unlimited lifestyle. 
Yes, he was expecting things to come from a source that wasn't really around him. He expected things to come. It was a level of expectation in Jesus so huge that everybody he connected with came under the umbrella of his favor and his inheritance. Who else do you know fed 5,000 people with some fish sandwiches? Just five. That's one fish sandwich for 1,000 people. And he still had stuff over because maybe he was expecting to meet some other people on the way back somewhere. Who knows? But this is an extraordinary time for us. And as a community, we have to come up to a higher level of perception, thinking, and language in the kingdom of God. And so I'm just putting you on gentle warning that the Holy Spirit is going to get in your face. And we need to get in each other's faces. Because the language of measure is not going to cut it anymore. Now we're learning a language that's taking us towards abundance, that's taking us towards fullness, and that's taking us out beyond our own requirements into the requirements of a community, into the requirements of a city. That's why, you know, God is looking for people to trust with money. And so when he says, I'm adopting this congregation as sons, it's because he has something to give you that is going to explode things in this region. Better watch out. Better watch out. So he's now Jesus, who knows all about inheritance. He's going to train you in how to become a joint heir. You're going to learn how to be a joint heir with him. And once you've learned that, he's going to push you towards the Father so you can be an heir of God. There's two inheritances here. One, the inheritance of your training, where you start to learn how to step into it. So he's going to train you how to see, how to think, how to speak, how to proclaim, how to declare, how to confess, how to give, how to step into something, how to expect. He's going to train you in all those things so that in your training, you are overcoming. And in the fullness of time, he's going to say, okay, you got it. He's going to push you towards the Father, and he's really going to mess with you. But now you'll be in a place where you'll want to be messed with. Because now something's got hold of you. And you understand that your inheritance gives you a destiny. It gives you a testimony. It gives you a legacy in the community of which you are a part. Now it's time to grow up. But right now, you're going to be growing out of something and growing into something. It's not what God is talking you out of that's most important, though. It's what he's talking you into. What he's talking you into. A son is one who is divinely connected to the glory of God. Who can act in a certain way who enjoys certain privileges and lives above the elements of the world because they have a new placement in Christ. This is a, it's a large open space that we must learn to explore in the spirit. That's why questions are important. What does this mean, Lord? Every situation you come into, Lord, what does this mean for you and me? What, is this, what, is, uh, what does this mean for the inheritance that I'm moving into? And what must I do? How do I partner with you? How do I walk with you in this? What are you expecting from me? What can I expect from you? What are you expecting from me in terms of a response? And so God is talking us out of fear. He's talking us out of anxiety. 
He's talking us out of all those negatives into a language that is full of expectancy, full of trust, moving into faith. Thank you. <laughs> Timing is everything, right? <laughs> Why weren't you screaming? <laughs> Fullness is a territory because God is a territorial spirit. When Israel were in bondage in Egypt, it wasn't just that he was going to talk them out of that place. He wanted to talk them into the promised land. It already marked out the territory because he's a territorial spirit. He's the one true, great, original territorial spirit. Everything else is a copy. He's a territorial spirit, and when he looks at you, and he looks at your family, and he looks at your household, he's got territory in mind for husband and wife, for parents and children. He's got territory in mind that he wants you to inherit. And that territory, they came out of hovels, but they didn't have enough food to eat, and he gave them a turnkey operation in Canaan. Houses you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant, wells you never had to dig. It's like so far above the norm of what they would be been used to for 400 years of institutional slavery. And God turns all of that on its head that's what we have to look forward to. The end of something and the beginning of something new, powerful, and dynamic. But we have to partner with God. And so when Israel came out of Egypt, there were three things that God had to do with them that he's going to be doing with us. First thing is we have to get closure on the past. You have to get closure on the way that you've been living, on the style of thinking that you have about yourself, on the, on the way of thinking that you are at this economic level and nothing's going to change, that it's just about getting through, getting over it, getting past it, you know, surviving, closure. You have to get closure on having a needs-orientated mindset. And you have to be converted. That was the second thing. This rabble of slaves had to be converted to a disciplined army that could take territory. Closure, conversion. God is going to give you uh, some means of converting from someone who is limited to someone who is living above a line of privilege and will never drop below it. And there are going to be tests here to see if you get it, but more than that, tests to see if you want it. Do you want this life? Then see the tests for what they are. There are opportunities to become. There are opportunities to receive. There are opportunities to see something. There are opportunities to grow in trust, to grow in faith, to grow in the power of your new level of relationship with God. All tests, everything comes with a test. And the test is, can you convert that promise into a lifestyle? Can you convert that prophecy into a lifestyle? Can you convert that encounter into an ongoing life experience? The best way to approach a test is to count it as joy. Because you know what a test is for. Because here's the thing about the Lord. <clears throat> he will never fail you. And I'm serious, he will never fail you. He's not going to give you a D or a C or a B. He will not fail you. He's going to give you an A and an A stands for accepted in the beloved. An A in inheritance stands for adopted as a son. 
So the test is about you knowing who you are and stepping into it. All tests are about lifestyle. All tests are about identity. All tests are about who I am now and me living in it. God's never going to fail you. But when you pass that test, he'll give you an A+. Because now you're into something, you're not just onto something. You're into it. You're in the life. And every test will enable you to go higher, deeper, and further. That's what they are designed to do. And then the third part of what Israel went through, there was closure, there was conversion to the people they needed to become, and then there was a commissioning to go into the land and take it. And there will be a commissioning in this congregation in Bethel, Cleveland, for us to go into particular territory and take it. That territory might be your place of employment. It might be your career. It might be a new business. Whatever it is, there is a commissioning. There is an authority upon you to step into this place and make it yours. And then open that place. An authority to open up that territory so that other people can come in behind you. That you could be the spearhead, the advance party, for something that God is going to do amongst the wider Christian community in this whole place we call Cleveland and beyond. Closure, conversion, commissioning. Three strands of behavior that follow each other, but they take us up into a different level. It's so important that you understand that with sonship comes privilege. With sonship comes privilege and power comes with it in order to open the door for other people. That's what Jesus is going to be doing as he trains us. He's going to be opening the door for us to be like him. That's what you have to look forward to. He's making you in his likeness when it comes to being unlimited. We become sons of inheritance because of the Father's relationship with Jesus in glory from the very beginning of creation. Inheritance is predestined for us. It is foreordained for us. And it's, it's foreordained out of the good pleasure of his will. So you have no idea how delighted God is at this moment looking at you. Because a place he's wanted to bring you for a long time. And now this is that day. This is that day. And he's looking at you differently. Now he's adopting you as sons. That means he will treat you as sons and daughters, not children. He will treat you as people who will take responsibility. He will treat you as people who can take hold of this thing and hold on to this thing and be changed by this thing. He will treat you as though you're on that level. That's where the tests come in. He wants to get you there as fast as he can. Why? Because we have things to do. The church in this country, in this region, is seriously behind the time of its own development. Seriously behind the time of its own identity in Christ and its own development. And, you know, God is wandering to and fro throughout the earth looking for a people on whose behalf he can show himself strong. And every time I've come here, it's always been that, what is the next thing for us? This is not the next thing. This is the big thing. This is the big thing. 
Because this will change everything. Joint heirs know how to make money work for them. How to invest for increase. How to dream, think, plan, and act at a higher level. To have a mindset on things above, not on things on the earth. To have a responsive identity to the kingdom and not just the world around us. To have the language of privilege as an heir of God and a joint heir in Christ. There's a language we have to adopt. It's going to be really important for us. Inheritance is a higher place of promise and privilege. So you have to look at your promises, even if they're 10, 15 years old, you're going to have to look at those promises and maybe even upgrade them as you bring them forward. Because they were given back there in a time when we had a certain level of language, when prophecy was spoken. But when God puts you in a different territory, those prophecies have to be upgraded too in the context of what God is saying, I want to give you. So we can take that prophecy and come before the Lord and say, so, does this reflect what you want to give me? Or do you want to upgrade the language? If you've got scriptures over your life, we can be taking them and saying, Lord, how do I see this in the light of the territory you've just put me into? Everything gets an upgrade. When Jesus said you have the prophets, the law and the prophets until now, which means you're not going to have them any further going forward. Because now the kingdom is here and everyone's pressing into it. What, that, what he's saying there was, is when I go to the cross, all the old things go with me. The law goes with me. All the prophetic goes with me. And that means the prophetic Old Testament prophecy has to go into the cross and be rebirthed in a habitational context, not a visitational one. So now all those kings, things come to pass because Christ the one who makes everything real, is now living in us. And so now we have to reevaluate those prophetic words at a higher level. That's a part of the prophetic ministry that we're going to be seeing going forward. We're going to be reformatting old promises because now they have to be made new because Christ is in us. Does that make sense? We're not in a visitational culture. We need to drop that word from our language. We're in a habitational culture, and God lives in us. So we are the revival. That's what inheritance gives you. It gives you a revival complex. Why? Because everything gets revived. Everything gets renewed. Everything gets restored. Everything comes at us because we're at this different level. We're not wondering if things will happen. We're living in a sense of wonder because they are. And that's who we are going forward. So anyway, as Forrest Gump would say, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Let me pray for you, though. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you. Thank you for the intensity of your purpose and your promise and your privilege coming into this congregation. Thank you that you are, have an intention to upgrade every household, every relationship, every family, every life, so that we are seen in the same light as Jesus. So that we see ourselves in the same place and the same position as him. So I ask in Jesus' name that, Lord, over this next season, our mindsets, our lens, our language would grow up to a whole different level of trust and faith and that we will be found living and walking above the line of our privilege because Jesus deserves that. Amen. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it.
All right, Graham.